everybody. Welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Timmy Nafso here. I have Rob Cameron from Visa joining me today, an executive with over 20 years of payment and financial technology experience, global head of acceptance solutions at Visa based out of London, uh, proudly focuses on clients, partners, colleagues, and accountable for domestic and international operations, as well as driving global expansion. Rob, thanks for joining me today. Really appreciate the time. Oh, it's terrific to see you this morning. Happy to be yeah. here. Yeah, awesome. What part of the world are you in right now? By I'm the way? in uh, I'm in Visa's New York office. So two some New York. Okay, awesome, uh, awesome. And and you know, I was uh, I, I always like to dig in first about Rob himself, Rob Cameron. You know where you came from, how you ended up in this space, a little bit about what Rob loves to do. I was on your uh, your LinkedIn checking you out, and it's it's really cool to see your uh, lengthy experience in the space. I say twenty plus years, but the plus is. Uh, more than plus. I think I could throw 25 on there, maybe even 30, just depending. Not on quite 30. The <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> so, but you know, you've been, you've been, uh, you've been at places like uh, uh, Chase Merchant Services, uh, CEO at Barclays, uh, Barclay Card. You've done a lot over the, the course of your career. And it would be really cool to, to understand how you got into payments in general and how this journey has been for you. Yeah, so so payments uh, payments started as a dog walk for me um, because uh, I met someone. There's a payment company called ACI. They're still out there uh, where I started my career in payment infrastructure back in '97. And uh, when I was looking for a job after university, the person that ran their Canadian business happened to live on my street and uh, also had a poodle. <laughs> and so so these are how like connections are made. I applied for this job. I was 20 years old when I applied. I started at 21. Uh, so you really put an age on me now and, uh, and uh, ended up starting a career in payment infrastructure all the way back then. And, you know, I, I like to say it was way before payments were cool. Just back then, um, I wasn't really, my wife said like, don't bring up the fact you work for a payments company. It's a, it's a conversation killer. Just tell them you work for a software company. It'll be easier. Steve, so are like, what is payments back? Remember, payments back then were pretty basic, right? Big time, big time. I, I remember my uh, when we got into the space of payments and being that we're from the hotel business, uh, my brother's explaining to my dad that there's a, a 2000 around that time. And we had supermarkets and stores and hotels and the supermarkets didn't accept payments yet. There was no interchange classification yet for the supermarket industry. It was too expensive. But hotels had started shifting from direct billing and from, you know, checks to credit card payments that we would knuckle bust or knuckle yeah. bust those things and then key them into a terminal at the end of the day. You never knew if it was valid or not. But my dad, when we said we're getting into this business, he asked if it was legal to get us a, a, a swipe and take a, a little part, pennies of every single transaction. Wait, wait, wait. Is this legal what y'all are doing? That's so amazing. it was so foreign to people what was happening in the payment ecosystem. And very simple, by the way, just a couple of terminals and uh, a few ways to run run transactions, which is much different than it is today. Well, so over these years, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say back when I worked with ACI, I remember I found uh, early in my career. And, you know, there's those times when you're close to your paycheck when things got a little thin. And I found a grocery store in my neighborhood in Toronto that would take a credit card. And so they benefited from me. And I think a lot of other people kind of figured that out. That they could use a credit card there to pay. And it's nice to have the opportunity to pay now and pay later, right? And and obviously Amazing. everyone figured out that you make it easy for consumers to pay and they'll shop more, right? Yeah. And you know, I think, you know, if you look at what payments was and still is, I mean, it was considered, I think, in the 90s and especially early 2000s, really an emerging market as it as it relates to what was happening from an ecosystem perspective. So just by being staying the, the the path, it lends well to more experience, more experience lends well to understanding the habits because we're in the, 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 the game. And I think when people say, hey, who's an expert? I mean, Rob Cameron, you're an expert in the space. I mean, not just from sheer time in the space, but also from your understanding of what is happening at the, the consumer level, which is which is really cool to see, and globally, because I like to tell this as well, the story about in 2015, EMV was launched here in the United States. And people are like, wow, this new thing, chip and pin. In 1992 was actually when it hit France, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken there. Yes. You know, 92. And, and 
it's like, wait, EMV, chip and pin. So it also shows that the United States, based on the banking system, based on kind of um, less of a centralized banking approach, takes a little bit longer for the consumer habits to shift as time goes on. And I'm, I'm seeing that you have experienced a lot of global uh, visibility as to what's happening in the ecosystem, which is really yeah. cool to see. Yeah, I think back then I was running product uh, strategy for a company called Moneris, big, uh, now a very big uh, Canadian acquirer. At the time, we came into the US and built a really nice business building, using the fact that Canada was already EMB and the US wasn't. And uh, and I think that your uh, your brother, Greg, that's how I met him. He was running Moneris US uh, at the time, yeah, nice. so small world in payments. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So as we We'll talk a little bit about product and the, the habits and all that. But, you know, Rob, uh, uh, family wise, what you enjoy doing, what is what's Rob doing when he's not working and changing the landscape of payments? Um, right now, I spend uh, time, I guess, three boys, um, all Gen Z's. So I get to watch their payments habits, which we can talk about. But um, <laughs> I've got a 14 year old who loves basketball. And uh, we uh, over Easter, I taught him to golf, which uh, I shouldn't I should say I was there while someone else taught him to golf. And I got a lesson too. But uh, but I've done that lately with him. And then uh, and then I've got twins that are seniors. And so lots of time trying to figure out where in the world they're going to go to uh, go to school at the end of the year, which uh, which seems to be coming to some kind of a conclusion. Uh, but, you know, it looks like we'll have, uh, have at least one in London and probably one over here somewhere. That is super cool. That's super. By the way, I've never been to London. It's on my bucket you list. You got to come. So, yeah. I know if people think, oh, how have you never been to London? But that, that's, that's on my Take list. Take you to a proper sure. football game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which football is the question? Well, uh, the I, I'm a soccer team. player. So, yeah, growing up, I was just, I'll do either football, by the way. I love both. But like, you know, soccer was my game for sure. It's fun. It's a good uh, it, there. It's something to experience when you're across. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So awesome. Favorite place that you've ever been in the world, uh, wh whether visit or lived uh, with all of your experience. Um, favorite place to live is London. Uh, I feel really lucky to be there. It's been a great city. I travel extensively, but I really like, um, it's been great for my family, very international. So I think that's been, uh, that's been terrific. Favorite place might be Nosar in Costa Rica, which is this amazing hippie beach town, uh, which you can write put, you can write that down. Uh, and, uh, and they do accept visa cards, but it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great space with nice warm water and a surf that even someone who can't surf like me can get up on. Yeah. You know, Rob, it's interesting. Like nobody ever says Detroit, Michigan. Like I've asked so many people. And it's, Have you I don't, Detroit, Michigan it's, lately? This is where I live. <laughs> this is where I'm at, man. Oh, it's, hey. it's cold, man. I've asked my family. I'm, I'm, you know, first generation board here in the okay. States and, I've asked my dad several times, I'm like, out of all the places, like everywhere in the world, anywhere in the United States, Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. And so the story goes, the Ford family and the Ford assembly line was a big part of the ability to, to, to feed the family. So that was okay. kind of where that, that came from. Um, but yeah, definitely not on anybody's list. I can't throw too many stones. I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, so I was pretty close. There you go, yeah. it's, a, yeah. it's pretty cold in the winter where I grew up too. It is. It is. I'd visit Toronto for everything Canadian Thanksgiving in October be, uh, uh, in my, my younger college days. A lot of fun because we're right across the bridge here from yeah. Detroit. How to go through Windsor and, and we're there. So awesome. So as we talk about what is happening at Visa, all of the, the habits and consumer trends. Um, I know ETA, Electronic Transaction Association, you actually are discussing there how everyone, everywhere, every time, digital natives are shaping the future of payments, shaping the future of payments. And people say, man, does somebody have a crystal ball to know what's happening with payments? I think it's not a crystal ball as much as it is just witnessing the habits of the Gen Z group, and then now what is the alpha group, which I have children kind of mine are 2008, 2010, 2012. Okay. And I'm watching how they interact in general. Uh, last week for Easter, we were actually in Las Vegas and I encourage my kids to interact with humans. And by the way, I would never, this is the first time I took my kids to Las Vegas. Somebody said, why would you take them to Las Vegas? But 
it's a like for a three or four day trip where it's not Florida because we always do Florida. Yeah. Where else can you go to get the weather? We're trying to get out of the cold. So we're like, all right, Vegas will do that. And then the sphere was really cool to see by oh, the way. Oh, really neat. Yeah. Really cool experience with the kids. Took them to a magic show, uh, Shin Lin, that was on um, okay. American Got Talent. We did a bunch of like little cool things, great restaurants, Buddy V's, and those types of things. So anyway, well, I encourage well, them to interact. Next trip. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Not, not so bad. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm saying to them, look, I want you to go up and you go and speak to the host or the hostess. You go and call and order the room service or whatever it is. And um, my son did not know, and he's the 2012 born. He did not actually know how to hold the phone uh, at the at the hotel. Like he actually had the, and he's like, I can't hear what they're saying. I'm like, yeah, just bring that down. And the joke is that people have been saying is they don't do this. They do this when you ask them how you use your hand to hold a phone. So with that being said, we have this, um, you know, new generation of VR that's coming into our world, AI, but really frictionless payments, that payments are not something they really want to think about. Less clicks is where everybody's trying to get to in the payment world. So from that perspective and looking at how Gen Z is operating and so on and so forth, what can you tell us about what you're seeing globally, because we're a little bit behind here in the States, like we just uh, discussed, but also what is that crystal ball looking like as we move into the future? Well, I like, let's think about your kids, right? And so my kids started their payments experience and the first thing they bought was, um, well, it wasn't what we bought, right? So I went to, uh, I used to go to the store with change and buy like sour keys, which are like these, you know what they are. So these sour keys, they put your dirty hand into the dirty jar and pluck out a couple and it was like a nickel or something. Right. Um, yeah. my kids like spend their allowance. I, I looked on like the in-app purchases. Right. So if I look and, um, and so they, most of their first purchases would have all been just online in-game purchases for things like Fortnite skins and yeah. level ups and, and, and the like. And I think my youngest, has taken his debit card for a walk like once. He took his Visa debit card to the store to see if it worked and then um, took a picture of it and put it into his iPhone as a uh, as an Apple Pay instrument and uh, has never, I, I'm sure he couldn't even find that card now if, I, if I, I'd have to like give him a reward to try and track it down, right? So they're, they're digital, right? They want a digital credential. They want a digital credential that they can buy online and they put a digital credential in their phone and that's how they expect the world of payments to work. So they're not starting from yeah. where you and I started of kind of learning to use this stuff. And uh, like their baseline of understanding is high sophistication with very low tolerance for friction. Like the idea that a transaction wouldn't get through or anything like that is foreign to them and would immediately cause them to like switch to another another offering, right? Absolutely. And, and you see it in even their viewing habits of how they consume content. You know, I have mentioned several times this strange interaction with characters that there aren't a lot of TV shows that they're watching that they're keeping track of characters, a lot of YouTube shorts and scrolling and things like that. And then back to the gaming, them watching gamers is one part of it, which is really interesting. So what are you doing? Yeah, it's frustrating. But then I step back and I'm like, you know, it was funny because my son said to me, I was watching the NFL and he's like, Hey dad, what's up? I'm like, nothing, just watching the lions, you know, play. He's like, why aren't you going and playing? I'm like, wait, what? He's like, you always tell me why I'm watching a game or a game. Why are you not just going and playing football? I'm like, whoa, whoa, different. But he did strike a core. I was like, yeah. he had me for a quick second, you know? Um, and what we're seeing as well is Everything that they interact with is quicker. It's on demand. I used to have to, I was like, you know, there was something called a rerun when we used to want to watch a TV show again. There's no reruns. Everything is at your fingertips. In the Tesla ecosystem, as an example, the way that we pump gas or pump electricity is fully through the application. It recognizes yeah. your car. You plug it in. It starts to move. It fully understands what's happening, gives you st uh, stats on how much you charge and so on and so forth. Back to this experience of the new way of whether it's gasoline or it's ele uh, electricity or whatever it is, everything's in app. And it's 
really scary on one side because we want to hold on to the horseshoes and the horse and the carriage concept. Like, you know, what are we going to do? But then an entire new ecosystem of opportunity is coming from this. Um, so the in-app experience, I know Visa is doing a lot with what, they, what, what is like the entire network, authorized.net, ANET. Um, we also have the, the, the Visa acceptance platform. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what is changing at Visa? Because this is what's forming the Gen Z or keeping an eye on the Gen Z and eventually the alpha habits as we continue to move into the future. Yeah. So, so well, first of all, we want to make it as easy as possible to allow you to put your Visa credential into the apps you use to run your life, right? And so, you know, using your charging example, I have an electric car. My neighbor has an electric car and we were, um, we got the place where we park to allow us to put a charger in. And then it's like, well, how do we figure out who uses what power? And we're like, well, we'll kind of split it. And then we're like, well, maybe there's an app for that. And sure enough, we found an app that would allow us each to kind of pay for our own thing. So it was fair, right? And it's like, there's just an app for everything. And, and obviously, then you, if you could put your Visa credential on it, it just makes it super simple for you to use. And, um, and, and so if you take a step to kind of my part of the world, so I work in uh, and lead Visa Acceptance Solutions, which is all the solutions we do on the seller side of the ecosystem globally to help us accept payments and help our clients. So whether you're a small business, a corporate a payment facilitator, or acquirer, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to accept payments. And we accept other credentials too, right? So we, you know, obviously on the on the seller side, you want to be ready for consumers to make an electronic payment, whether that's from account or from card. And so we support that ecosystem. And then um, to, to make it easier, one of the things we're trying to solve for in the business is, um, you know, when I and I get to travel, we could talk about some of the, the interesting places I've got to be recently. But, you know, the, the three common things that people are always wanting to talk about is just the complexity. How do they keep pace with the fact that consumers demand to be able to put, you know, their credential in, they need to be protected by fraud, support latest authentication, mandates, all that. And it needs to work every time. Or that Gen Z, you know, Gen Alpha of yours and the rest of us will just click to another option, right? So, so the first thing they want to talk about is that. The second thing they want to talk about is connectivity. And you guys know how to do this uh, as well. But it, embedding payments into the app, like the, you know, the app that I use to charge my car or whatever these are, you know, how do I get my payments embedded into the apps? And so that's the second thing people want to talk about. And then the third thing they want to talk about all the time is just the pro profitability, like how, how do you run this infrastructure? And so Visa, what we did was um, set up, we're calling the Visa acceptance platform, where effectively we want to be like a cloud hosting Amazon web service type environment for you to pull down the pieces and modules of payments you need to support your infrastructure. Because we recognize a lot of people already have some infrastructure or they're already there, but they might want to support, say, network tokens. And We'll give them a way to connect up to the major network tokens, including Visa, in order for them to improve their authorization rates and uh, and get access to the latest possible credentials on their and consumers. And so whatever their use case, what we want to have is modules for them to be able to, to leverage to help them stay current with those payment experiences and deal with those three challenges, which are pretty consistent wherever I go in, in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and you know, I mentioned authorized.net earlier. And that was my first experience with a gateway in my career of what is this gateway? How does it connect to things and how fast it's evolved has been quite amazing. I also had experiences with CyberSource. Um, those products are, are still alive and well in Visa's ecosystem. What's shifting about the CyberSource versus authorized.net or the combination of the two's tech and offering? There are two like amazing platforms that I've just been around yeah. the ecosystem for a zillion years. Everyone has a story, including me. And uh, so the case of CyberSource, um, you know, I've been a visa for about a year and a half. Prior to my arriving, they invested a pile of money in microservicing and updating the code base. Um, what that allowed us to do, and we announced last year kind of after I arrived, was that we're going to unbundle and actually offer the individual components to be, you know, and that's how we created this acceptance platform, a good piece of it is basically unbundling one of our most valuable assets 
and allowing you to use the individual components. So we still have tons of merchants and platforms around the world that use CyberSource because it's you know great at um, great at at payments and fraud, as strict cost rates and all that good stuff. But you know, not everyone needs the whole thing. So we also now offer the individual components alongside our scaled network products and alongside our post-purchase assets. So give you a single way to integrate and get access to multiple pieces that you might need to run your payment infrastructure. So CyberSource is continuing to do very well, but we're also then kind of shifting and have this new market that we're offering it to, which is acquires and payment facilitators that some of them would have seen it as a competitor before. And now they're like, great, well, if I can use that from you and it sits in a Visa data center and you can cost effectively going to that profit point, um, then they're all for it. So, so that's CyberSource. Um, Authorize.net is this you know, amazing platform. You know, if you searched, uh, you know, I did this recently and it was like, what are the best payments? It still comes up on like organic search. It was the original platform that let you connect any app and any acquirer. So amazing. Um, and, uh, and it still has, you know, something close to a half a million small businesses on there. Right. So it, it still stayed relevant, still board lots of new ones. Um, and, um, and, and what we've done is because we invested in this infrastructure that we're offering the ecosystem, we're actually using that same infrastructure in upgrading authorized.net. So we will, and, you know, we're announcing a net reimagined. It'll have a new UI. And, you know, a bunch of features that you expect around using your data differently, but, but maintain that simplicity and importantly, the connectivity on either side um, that allows us to be successful. But also because of the, the fact we're moving it to the platform that's international, um, we can, we're, we're likely going to take ENET outside the U.S. and Canada market because um, today that's the markets that we offer it in. Um, so we'll actually, some of our partners have wanted in the ISVs we work with have wanted us to offer it in other markets and there's demand uh, out there. So we'll probably take it to other markets um, post 25 as well. That is awesome. That's awesome to hear. What's your you that? Oh man. So it's really funny. The first time um, I was selling an ISV and I had no idea what like, Number one, what an ISV was, and back to your comment, uh, which was actually your 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 wife's comment that said, "Don't tell people you're in payments." That was kind of the same feeling. We would actually, you know, we do software for. It was always like this dance around yeah. being the merchant services door to door uh, person. And what we had identified at that time was when the mortgage industry kind of crashed. Uh, back then, a bunch of people from the mortgage industry came into the payment space, and everybody was just doing a lot of um, yeah, dishonest <laughs> type of, of sales at that time as we experienced. Well, yeah. what we said was like, let's level up and let's try to talk to software companies where we could really add value. Being that we were in the hospitality space, we knew that there were just a few characters and players that played in the hospitality space. So we really started to focus on what were the gateway players um, at that time. And Authorize.net was our leading product. So the first question that came up was, Hey, so uh, do you all have an API into yeah. our, where we can talk? And I'm looking at this. I know like API, what is this magic? This per, like it connects, yeah. like how does this all work? And uh, sure enough, got an authorized.net rep on at that time. You know, the other part of authorized.net that was really helpful is that rep is like, hey, look at our video library of everything we have and how to use it. And by the way, if you end up going down, you could use our virtual terminal. And then if you wanted to, and so all of these things to me was like, this is it. Um, and I was probably the generation at that time that, you know, the Rob Cameron of 2004 was talking about like, hey, they're going to want something that connects yeah. systems together and yeah. that, you know, you can have a virtual terminal and an omni-channel experience. And by the way, we're going to come out with a swiper that you could actually swipe credit cards on a mobile device. And so like it did all of those things for, for, for us. And I was like, I really don't need to look further um, than what was authorized.net with the exception of CyberSource, which offered level two and level three processing at that right. time, which was huge for manufacturing organizations to make them competitive yeah, in the market. Yeah. Also an emerging opportunity for us at that time. And we really did quite well with both Authorized.net and CyberSource as we were growing as an organization. So, you know, thanks to, you know, not only the founders of those companies, but also to Visa for, you know, since 2010, when I really started to understand what an API was. 
It's amazing. Really, really good cool. for you. And that, those are great stories, yeah. but I think they're pretty consistent across the market. And I, you know, I think that uh, Visa has been a good shepherd of those assets. And I, I'm really excited actually about what we're going to see, um, at, you know, very shortly with the, the next release of ANET too. Rob, when we think about with the last few minutes that we have, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about AI and the future of AI and how we're seeing that's going to affect not only the, the industry and how Visa is looking at AI, it's moving so quickly, it's scary that how do you even keep up with it from a product perspective, but how is it going to affect, you know, that back end experience, if you will, and how it moves into the front end? Great question. So we at Visa, we're kind of challenging our colleagues all the time to kind of come up with different ideas and use cases. We've got hackathons going, but like one of the cool ones on a product we've talked about is uh, a cyber source. We've got all this documentation over the years and, you know, all these code snippets you can use. And the team applied generative AI to that to not only allow you to ask questions and it pulled down the documentation, uh, but also with like little prompts to make it super simple to like, here's a question you might want to ask or in, you know, cause not everyone knows how to write the right prompts, but it'll actually do the code too. So it'll give you the code snippets to put on your site. Um, so we're launching that in the next couple of months. So that cycle time from idea to actually something we can commercialize is kind of like nine months. It's pretty quick um, considering, yeah. you know, remember we run this thing in a lot of countries for a lot of customers. And uh, yeah. so these tools can really make a difference fast. Um, so I like, you know, on the back end, I think that's a nice example um, that's a little different. Obviously, everyone's looking at customer service and all those types of things. And, you know, from a consumer standpoint, you know, I think this is, uh, you know, we got Mother's Day in a couple of weeks. I think mothers are going to get an upgrade um, because I'm pretty lazy, not lazy, that's not fair, but I'm very thoughtful, but I'm thoughtful <laughs> in a consistent way, which is my wife gets a candle every year. And, uh, and I think that with AI, on behalf of my less thoughtful, boys, the AI assistant that I use to help me at work and some other pieces t today will actually turn around and I'll have an AI assistant for my life. And I think in about a year, call it Mother's Day next year, you know, there'll be a similar priced gift that'll be much more tailored and thoughtful. And it'll be because my AI assistants helped me. Um, I may not yeah. get a credit, um, but it'll have helped me. They help. Yeah. <laughs> Just ideas. That's all it is. And by the way, 12 months is not that far away. That's how quickly it's moving, which means yeah. the world has to move a little bit quicker as well. We feel like we're moving fast. It's much faster, but really interesting. Visa has all this data. They have the ability to also say, hey, mom, we see all of your spending habits. You never bought this, but so many in that kind of classification of making the same purchases, this would be a great purchase because we've seen that these people love it and have not returned that product as an example um, at that vendor merchant level. So really cool to see that coming to, to fruition eventually. Yeah, no, I, and I think, you know, Visa is one of the few counterparties in this world that I would trust with my consumer data and I'd want controls and other things around it. But, you know, you think of organizations that you trust with your data to make it simpler for you to get a more tailored experience. And, uh, and, and Visa is one of those companies for me as a consumer. And, and obviously I'm biased because I work here, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I know we treat the, the data properly. Awesome. Awesome. Rob Cameron, thank you so much for joining today. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm looking to visiting you in London and going to that football game. Yeah, we'll get you to uh, okay, you do the Premier League game. We can go Premier, see Okay, there, there we Spurs. go. Tottenham Hotspur is my team, so we can go see them. Number that four in the awesome. league right now. So depending on when you see this, hopefully we'll hold at least that spot. Let's go. <laughs> looking forward to it, Rob. Thank you so much for the time today. Awesome. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too.